everyone needs people in their lives who I, I call door openers. Uh, people who look at you and, and for some reason that uh, is unbeknownst, they see some potential in you and they open a door and they create an opportunity for you. Our chapel speaker today is Carlton Hauck. He's a good friend of mine. Bring the table up, would you mind? Thank you. Um, he's a good friend of mine and a long time ago when Heritage was between pastors and when they were so desperate that they asked me to speak. Uh, I, I went over there and Carlton was a song leader. And as you'll see in a minute, one of the amusing things the folks in Heritage liked about that was that all the growth hormones that God shorted me on, he evidently gave to Carlton. And the two of us on the platform together were kind of a humorous thing. Well, Carlton has married 50 years to Pam. He's had a, a business, local businessman here in the valley for, for 50 years selling medical supplies. Uh, he's been a worship leader for 35 years. But for 35 years, he, he also was a prison volunteer at the State Correctional Institution in Dallas, Pennsylvania. And as Carlton and I would minister together at Heritage, one week he said to me, you ever been inside prison? No. How about you come in? And he brought me in for the Saturday Bible study. And uh, which he would have led if he hadn't opened the door and let me lead it. And it was amazing. That open door then, when, when God made one of the biggest turns he ever made in our family's life and was directing us to go to South Africa, Carlton and Pam were the first, well, the first two people we talked to about it. And then the guys in prison. And I said, am I having a midlife crisis? Or is this of God? And they said, Jim, we'll pray about it. And they did. And the next time I was back, they said, we think this is of God. And more than that, these guys who at that time were making between like seven and 15 cents an hour working their job in prison, they said, we are your first supporting church. And the Protestant chapel at SCI Dallas supported us for 14 years for 50 bucks a month with guys making seven to 15 cents an hour. It is fabulous. My friend Carlton Hauck was the door opener for that. I want him to preach the word of God to us. I want you to get his story. I want you to get interested in this ministry. Carlton, come on up. Microphones work better if you turn them on, I found. Good morning. No, 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 no. Good morning. God is good. Whoa, whoa. No, no, no. I need to hear you, okay? God is good. All the time. You better know it. You better show it. You better live it. It's one of the things that we say at SCI Dallas. As Jim said, I've, I volunteered there in 1975. That was the beginning of ministry for me in prison. We started with the Bill Glass Crusade. He was a former pro football player that loved the Lord and would go into prisons with a team of athletes all over the country and tell them about Christ. I went in that weekend. Why? I don't know. But I did. You know, the prison's only four miles from my house. Maybe that was the reason. I knew the guy that was heading up the Bill Glass Crusade locally. And I went in, and at the end of three days, I said to Ron, I said, Ron, you've spent a ton of money. What now? He said, what are you talking about? I said, we need to do something to follow up. And what do you want to do? I said, let's start a Bible study. In 1975, we started the Saturday morning Bible study. It is still going to today. About 75 men come out on a Saturday morning to hear the word of God taught on a book-by-book -book basis and how it applies to your life. That began in SCI Dallas, the backbone for the church that we have today. A church that is strong, 
Divisions, yes. A church that loves the Lord. A church that knows how to praise God. You guys are sitting too quiet for me. Man. I'm used to, by the way, the one thing that is different here is your dress. When you're in prison, you wear browns. You have a brown jacket for winter. You have a brown light shirt when it's cool, when it's a little warmer. You have a brown t-shirt, occasionally a white t-shirt. You have brown pants and everything is marked with the letters D-O-C. Do you have any idea what that stands for? It is not Department of Corrections. When you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, it stands for the Disciple of Christ. I'm here to share my heart and my love for what I do. It's not easy, and it's not hard. I know that I am called. I know that I have been gifted in this area. And that's what you need to find out for your life. At SCI Dallas, we have over 2,100 inmates. They live in cells that are six feet by 10, if I'm not mistaken. There are bunks in there. There are two men that live in there, one on top, one on bottom, and all their earthly possessions will fit into one or two totes. That's it. There is a sink in there, and there is a commode in there, and they live there. We're structured here, I'm told to be done by 10 of 11, but we're structured at SCI Dallas also. You get up at a certain time, you go to chow at a certain time, you eat what they give you, you go back to your block, you are recounted, and then you are let out again if you wanna to go to the yard, if you have a job. By the way, the highest paid right now is 52 cents an hour. The average is about 24 to 26 cents an hour. You go to your job. You could mop floors in the cells, in the hallways of your block, and you could have an actual job because we do have jobs. I have several men that work for me in my office. The head chaplain, Chaplain Jackson, he has several men that work for him. We have a Catholic chaplain. We have an imam. We have, we are looking for a Native American. We have a rabbi that comes in. See, when you're here, you can just deal with one group. You teach what you, you can, you, what you want, what you can say. You, you can deal with that. When you're in a setting that is controlled by the state of Pennsylvania and their laws and their formats and everything else, we have to be more unified, I guess you would say, in what we do. The chapel that I'm in, where we hold our worship services, in the center of it is round. In one third of that is the Protestant table. In one third of that is the Islamic table. In one, and Jewish. In one third of that is the Catholic table. And it turns for each service that we deal with. When we are done with a service, we have to close the doors so that if another faith comes in, they are not offended by what they see. It has to be a a chapel that is neutral. Now, that doesn't mean I can't teach the faith of Jesus Christ. I do. And we teach it throughout the week. We have many Bible studies during the week, both English and Spanish. 
in order to come to a Bible study, you have to be on a call out. You have to send a request slip to me. Chaplain Halk, I would like to be put on the call out for such and such a Bible study. Then we have to go into the computer and add that person to it. See, we have to have accountability for every inmate as to where they are in case something happens and something comes up. When you are behind bars, you are owned by someone else. They tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and everything else. It's not an easy life. Yes, they may have some perks. They can go and lift weights. They can play basketball at certain times. Everything is done in about an hour and a half time slot. Jim, think of me. I've got all this work to do. I get help an hour and a half at a time. And yet we're required to do what really has to be done in a full eight hour day. It gets a little bit crazy. We hold church services three times a week. We have a Wednesday night service. We have a Saturday afternoon church service. And we have a Sunday morning church service. Those church services are open. You don't have to sign up for them. They're an open call out. We invite guests in from the outside. This weekend, a church, Deliverance Evangelistic Church from Philadelphia will be coming in and they will be doing a seminar Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, Sunday morning, and Sunday afternoon. That had to be a call out. That has to be on a call out to do. But they will come in and they will teach a program this time on inner healing for the man. And they will take and they will teach those services. Uh, otherwise, I invite guests to come in. Uh, you guys were supposed to be down a couple weeks ago, but Jim Reeves got sick on a Wednesday night, so we're going to be rescheduling that. I, I invited your worship team up here to come down. Please. I can be through the prison an opportunity for you to stretch your legs, to stretch yourself to come down and minister. It does not have to be just men. Women are allowed and invited also. Always remember where you go, you always should dress properly. But please, if you want to come down, if someone at the end of this, the, your heart is stirred about prison ministry, there might even be in three, there's three state prisons nearby. There's one in Waymart, there's one south of Wilkesbury called Retreat, and then there's our prison, SCI Dallas, right outside of Wilkesbury. And sometimes in different ones, there's opportunities for internship. Don't ever not try. Don't ever not call someone at the prison and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about this. The head of the prison uh, it's, uh, of the chaplaincy program is called FCPD, facility, I don't know. I keep, for, I get, as long as I know the letters, that's all that matters. But my FCPD is Ricardo Jackson, who went to school here. The FCPD down at Retreat, his wife went to school here. And the FCPD down at Mahanoy or Frackville, Boyles, went to school here. This school has had a great influence in this area, in the chaplaincy programs and what is taught and what is done in our local state prisons. Our congregation's a little bit different than this one or the church that you go to. First of all, we are probably 60% black. We are about 20%, maybe, maybe 50% black, 20% uh, Hispanic, 30% white. Uh, and out of that, if you took a, a survey sometime, we figured it out one time, there's about 25 different Protestant denominations represented in one church family. Amen, yes. Crazy, yes. One group likes this, one group likes that. 
I've got people from the Mennonite Amish background, and I've got people from black holiness over here. But we all have one thing in common. Jesus Christ came to save sinners like us. And it's all through the blood of Jesus Christ, not of works, that we can come together as one body, disagree in some areas, yes, but worship the same Lord and lift him up wonderfully. Our worship services are a blast. I just love them. It's too quiet in here. It's too quiet in here. I, I, I'm used to talk. I'm used to feedback. I, I'm, I'm used to guys in the back saying stuff. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Our worship services are alive. I'm not saying yours aren't. I thoroughly enjoyed this morning, trust me. Man, alive, that first hymn, I had never heard it before. I, I have emotions that I enjoy sharing. I'll tell you what, you get to some of that stuff, our guys would be pump fisting and shouting and screaming because they have been so forgiven and they realize where they came from, and they realize what God has done for them, and it has made us one in Christ, whether we're black or white, Hispanic, whatever we may be, that we can join together and lift our hands and our voices and our prayers and our praise to Jesus for what he has done. I never want to stifle emotions in our church. I want the men to be able to share. I want the men to be able to have that come forth. If God said in his word that I am to love him with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength, how can I not? How can I not express that with him? My wife and I in expressing our love for the Lord are totally different. <laughs> She's the quiet one. She's a tremendous prayer warrior. Oh my word, what a wonderful woman. When she says today, I'll be praying for you, I know she will. She'll be on her knees before the Lord encouraging me in prayer. But she's quiet in church. She'd be the one that sits there not me, I'll be on my feet. Right, come on, let's go. She loves the Lord just as much as I do. We're all different. Don't be afraid to show your love for him. You were never afraid to, share, to, to, to show and share your love for the one you love. And we're to love him more than the one that we love. Don't be afraid to share it. A couple of months back, we had a church service that just started off incredible. One of my favorite, favorite songs is hymns of worship songs is How Great Is Our Lord, How Great Is Our God. And the guys came, choir came, Mike does a solo part on the side. Pat was leading the choir. You can just feel the presence of the Lord fall. Just fall. And I looked at him and I said, that's all I have to do, keep going. I never got to preach that day. I didn't care. The power of God that fell that day the love for the Lord that was there. I could just turn to someone and say, pray. He prayed and he worshiped and he brought us along. Someone else, praise him. And we did that. 
I knew if I preached that day, it would be because it was out of self. God didn't want me to preach. He wanted us to lift him up and enjoy him and enjoy his presence and enjoy his love. I found out later, the gentleman that, that plays keyboards, he said to me, I looked around today, he said, the hardest men had tears coming down their faces in the service. And I do something else. God has brought this around for us as a church. We don't do the usual communion and they sung a hymn and went out. I believe that many churches have hardened the hearts of Christians in response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because one gets up to preach the word of God to convict the heart of sin, to draw that sinner to Christ, to draw that one back, and then we say, amen, go home. We have men that have been qualified that at the end of every service, three or four come up on this side of the auditorium and three or four come up on that side of the auditorium. Sometimes I give the invitation, sometimes an inmate gives the invitation. It doesn't matter who gives it. As long as it's given and men are given the opportunity to come and yield themselves to God. We open the invitation in two ways. We open it first of all for salvation. And as I'm talking to you, many times men have just jumped up and come down the aisle. And we open it for prayer. We open it for those that have a hurting heart to come and have someone put their arm around them and someone help and lift them up and their burden before the Lord. And I believe that's made a big difference in our church. I believe we need to respond when, when the Spirit of God is touching our heart. Not on Sundays, hey, so where are you going to watch the game today? Uh, who do you think is going to win the NASCAR race? Who's going to win the championship? I'm a big NASCAR fan. Well, I'll tell you what, at the end of church, I do not want to be talking about NASCAR. At the end of church, I, I, I want to know what, what, what's in my heart, what I need to give to God, what I need to share, what I need to do. Our church services are a little different. I've been known about prison ministry all my life, it seems. In business, I used to hand a pen out that said this pen was stolen from Mid-Valley Medical Equipment. And they would laugh and I'd say, oh, there's meaning behind that pen. You see, I preach and teach in a state prison. I was at a house one day. We had just put a, a stair lift in for a lady and I was explaining on her porch, sitting there with her, how it works. And my cell phone went off and it was my driver, Leo Unruh. I said, no, Leo, I, I can't meet with you today. We're doing the stair lift. I said, the best thing I could do is I could come up and meet with you Saturday as soon as I get out of jail. <laughs> now, that's a normal conversation for me. But when you're sitting on somebody's porch that doesn't know you and you say, I'll see you as soon as I get out of jail, the eyes got about this wide, the mouth <laughs> dropped. But you know what? That's my way, what God has given me, how to share the ministry that he has given me, that he has brought me into, and to be able to share the gospel many times with them. In Matthew 5, 27, it says, you've heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, that whosoever looketh on a woman, ladies, will turn it around. Whoever shall look on a man and lust after her hath committed adultery already in her heart.
One of the differences between my congregation and, and you is that what they have thought, they have done. They have gotten angry and killed someone. They have lusted after a woman and they have raped her. There are pedophiles, one of my staff. They've done things that you've thought. But according to the word of God, it's the same as doing them. I say that to not judge the men that are in there. Yes, they've committed crimes and they're paying for their crimes. But because of their crimes and because of now where they are and because of the gospel that is taught and preached at SCI Dallas, at Retreat, at Waymart, at these other prisons, the gospel that is taught so many lives have changed. Men have gone out and started churches. Men have gone out and restored families. They have become productive in the community on the outside. Why? Not because of anything that they have done, but because of the grace of God. It's the same grace that saved you, saves them. So the next time you look at someone you have that road rage, whatever it may be. The only difference between you and them is you're thinking something and they did it. According to this, it's sin. Be careful. Why did that song go? Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. And today, be careful what you put in your mind. One of the things that I do every Sunday, whether I preach or I don't preach, is I ask men, are you going home? Is anyone going home this week? That's one of the great encouragements in prison, to see an inmate stand up and say, I'm being paroled or I'm maxing out of my sentence Tuesday or Wednesday. And I call them down, find out where they're going, talk to them for a minute. We put our arms around them and we pray over them and we send them forth. That's an exciting time. I'm sorry, but this one always chokes me up. There's juvenile lifers in the state of Pennsylvania all throughout the country. I think we have over 500. A juvenile lifer is this, someone under the age of 18 that has committed murder. And they sentence them to life. One Sunday, several months ago, a man got up, my left, and he walked over, and he handed me a piece of paper. He was the first juvenile lifer being let out of Dallas after over 47 years. 47 years. And he's going home. Needless to say, there wasn't a dry eye in chapel that day as we loved him, as we put our arms around him to send him forth. That's a highlight of my week. The rest of my week, I have to counsel men that write. I can't even share with you some of the things that go on, why I have to counsel, what they're going through, what happens. I have to visit the whole, the RHU, where men, for whatever reason, whatever they've done, are locked up in that confinement area where they're allowed out of their cell one hour a day. I go to the infirmary and pray over the men that are in there and have sometimes take communion down to them. I have to do all of the normal things that go on with being a chaplain within the prison. For some, it's a hard job. 
It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of things. I have to do the bulletin. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to go to the hospitals on the street when men are out from the prison. And no matter what faith they are, I was there this past Monday, and one was from the Methodist community, and one was a Muslim. Muslims don't want me to pray over them in the name of Jesus, so I don't. But the other gentleman, I had a great time talking with him. I, I'm saying this and sharing my heart for one reason. There isn't any one ministry that is more important than another. Those that play their instruments are no, important, no more important than the one that's an usher, than the janitor that cleans up and puts everything away. You all have a gift that God has given you. Do you know what it is? Are you willing to use it? I never knew I had a gift. I never knew I had a love for prison ministry until I, until I started going. Sometimes you have to go out and try things to find out what your gifts are. Don't be afraid to do that. But whatever you do, be the best that you can be in that area. For you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for Jesus. You're doing it for the kingdom of God. You're doing it to bring that one that's close to hell into the kingdom of God so that he will spend eternity in heaven. We're not all called to prison ministry. I've had to tell two people in the last couple weeks, no, you can't join the choir. They couldn't sing. I said, sing with me. Amazing grace. They never hit one note. But I want to be in a choir. No. No. Let's find out what you can do. Find out, learn, go, dig. One of my former pastors said about being a pastor, he said, Carlton, he said, the Lord puts burdens on my heart about ministries in the church. But he said, it's not for me to go and say to someone, I want you to do this. I pray to the Lord, I ask the Lord to give that one that's in the congregation the burden and then they will come to me and say, I have a burden for this or I have a burden for that. Because if I go to one of you and say, I want you to do this, I want to get this ministry started, as soon as the troubles come, as soon as the hardship comes, you're going to bail. Why? Because it's not of your heart. If God gives you the heart, can you tell I have a heart for prison ministry? Okay? Where's your heart? Follow your heart, as they say. I had an inmate. What a great brother in the Lord. Oh, he loves the Lord. I don't know if he's 30 years old, and he's doing life. He will, that's life without parole. He will never get out. And he came to me and he said, the youth ministry. It's, a, oh, he said, we, we have so many of these men come, oh, I've got to quit. So many men coming in that, that they're young, they're gangbangers. They have no love for anything. They don't care about life. He says, I want to start a youth ministry. I said, go ahead. I'll give you the time slot. I don't know if it's even six months We've got well over 50 men that are signed up to come out and we average between 35 and 40. You ready for this? On Friday night at 6.30 until quarter of eight. And they come and they get in a circle and they have a Bible study. 
I've got eight men up in the front of the church that are doing a, 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 a prayer time. I've got 15 Spanish men the same time out right outside of my office that are in prayer for the ministry, for the chapel, for the church, for their families and everything that's going on. I use the word I, it's not me. Please don't take this personal, it's not me. It's the gift that God has given me to be able to go out and do these things. I covet your prayers. I can't tell you the difficulties and the other things that go on. The chaplains need your prayers. The guards need your prayers, the inmates. Inmates and guards have one of the highest rates of suicide there is. My ministry also goes to the guards, to the lieutenants, to the sergeants, to those that are there. I thank you for this time. Please find your love, find your heart, and do it. Father, open our hearts to follow you. So grateful for what you're doing through Carlton and the other brothers who are in the church and who are leading the church. And I ask that you would strengthen him, encourage him, and build him up in the holy faith to go back in there and keep on loving you in a hard place. Lord, keep us from squandering our lives. We want to follow you. We want to do that with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And I pray that you would lead us in Jesus' name, amen. See you guys later.